Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I want to make sure I'm on here. Yep. Anybody there yet? Oh yeah, it's working, it's working. Who's there? Just waiting for people to come on. Making sure everything's working. Hey, I got somebody, who's there? Amanda Rand, good morning. Got somebody over there on YouTube as well. Thank you, Amanda. All right. Good morning, Phyllis. <clears throat> Good morning, Mom. Good morning, Brittany. Good to have you guys on. It's been a while, but we're back. We're back. Oh, all four kids home, Rose. I will pray for you. All right, let me give you a rundown on Haiti here in just a minute. I'll give you a, let's see, I just wanna make sure I got everything here. There we go. Good morning, John. <clears throat> All right, good morning, Leanne and Lori. Just waiting for a minute, still before six. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Becky, Darren, good to be back. Darren, good to see you. All right. Um, so let me give you a little rundown, a little quick rundown, Haiti, what it was um, like. It's crazy. Uh, as you can see, I'm now darker. That's what happens in Haiti. Um, but I'm still lighter than everybody we will see in Haiti. Uh, <laughs> um Haiti, man, it's crazy there. So uh, it's it's like every movie you've ever seen of like post-apocalyptic times where, um, you know, the world was devastated and then, you know, what's left of the world. Um, no, it's, Becky, it's, it's not, I think India uh, is got some places that are poorer than Haiti, but it's uh, the poorest, from what I understand, it's the poorest country on this kind of part of the earth. We're kind of close by where we are. But uh, it just looks, I mean, everything's kind of rubble. Um, good morning, Chris. Good to see you, man. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's just brutal. I mean, it's just like they've been, they've been pummeled uh, several times. So um, I don't know. It's, just, it's, it's tough to see it when you're there. Uh, first couple days, you're really kind of processing, or I was really kind of processing, because you just get this sense when, as soon as you go in, um, as an American, especially, I wasn't the only one, and we were talking, and you just get this sense that you just want to try to figure it out. You want to figure out how to fix their situation, uh, and I'm not sure that that's the way to go. Uh, I think the longer that I was there, the more that I would realize that, uh, you know, they're they're not as unhappy as we make them out to be. There is a desperation there, that, but they're, you know, people people just live. People, uh, you know, you don't you don't get this sense of, um, you know, that. I, I don't know. I, I didn't really get a strong sense that there was no hope. You know, I'd heard several people, that was their thought. It was just like you feel this sense of hopelessness. But I also heard um, from those who have been back several times uh, that every time they go back, it just seems like there's a little bit of improvement, that there's, they've, they've made a little bit of ground. So, um, but I don't know, pretty intense. You know, I think, I think some of that stuff will come out in our Bible study times. Uh, just the, I mean, there's some things that kind of open my eyes in Scripture um, everything's different, right? I mean, all of Christianity is different. Verses read differently in your mind when you're in a world that's radically different than your own cultural context. Um, so when we're over there, even like we did a lot of worship songs and things like that. Uh, and when, when you're reading through worship songs, man, the, the words mean something so much different when you're in a country like that. When you're singing something and you're just like, okay, these lyrics... Uh, in, in our worship songs, you know, things that we've sang a hundred times before in our own context, and we just kind of bypass these things. And then when we go over there and you're singing the same songs in those contexts and in those cultures, uh, it just changes everything. I mean, it's just like, um, you know, uh, I was thinking about the song, we did the song Holy Spirit, and um, 
it's like the very first line in that is there's nothing worth more. And we're just talking about the presence of God and that the most valuable thing that we have is the presence of God. We've seen that so many times here in the States where you've got this line, you know, like the greatest or the most valuable thing in the world is, is the presence of God. And then when you're in Haiti and there's literally a, a lack of food um, and then you're still, you know, and people are, are desperate for things and they're desperate for just, I want to be able to eat and I want to be able to, uh, you know, just make it through the day to sing a song that says there's nothing worth more than his presence. That, that's a, that's, it just changes it, right? Uh, so I think that was kind of what, what I experienced is, you know, because I was leading songs um, every night and a couple times in the morning too. And it just seemed like every single song that we that we read just talks about the, or that we sang, talks about the value of God. And, um, you know, so we, we, we realize that, you know, that can get challenged a little bit when you get into those parts of the world. So, uh, good morning, Brad. Good morning, Shanna. Saw Adam on there. Good morning, Amanda Acorn. Good to see you. Um, you don't miss what you don't have. <laughs> or, or that you've never known you've had, right, John? Um, okay, so... We got a few of us on here. We're back. Um, I'm excited to be back. I like my routine. I like getting up in the morning with you guys. I like opening the Bible. It is Easter weekend. It is uh, tonight. It, today is Good Friday. <clears throat> and kind of interesting, right? Because we just took a break um, as if we were too far ahead. Uh, as, as if we were too far ahead, we took a break. We took a week off only to land in chapter 15 of the book of Mark. So if you have a Bible, open it up, chapter 15 of the book of Mark. What's interesting is we are sitting in a, this weekend, we're going to be in 15, um, probably won't get to 16 until Monday, but it, the, the section that we're in is so Easter focused, it's kind of funny that we just are like locked into the right time at the right place, um, that we're in the Easter story, even though we've been going for months through the book of Matthew and Mark on Easter that we're in the Easter story. That's kind of amazing to me. Uh, let's pray together, jump into chapter 15, and uh, let God speak to us. Lord, I thank you to be back. I thank you that I am back. I thank you that there's people that have gotten up this morning to be back with me. Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom to us to understand your word, um, not, just, not just knowledge, not just stuff that, that goes into our heads so that we get proud of what we know, but truly that you would speak to our lives that we could change um, that we can walk after you, that we can look more like you, and maybe even instead of pride, you would build in us a humility. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, <clears throat> here we go. We got a few of us on here. Verse 1 of chapter 15 of the book of Mark. If you have a Bible, open it up, follow along with us. Uh, if you see me reaching across and scratching my shoulder, it's because bugs bit me while I was in Haiti, believe it or not. They were bugs. Um, so here we go. Verse 1 of chapter 15. And as soon as it was morning, <clears throat> so Jesus has been arrested. Je I'm, I, I got to give you the recap. Jesus has been arrested. Uh, the disciples have fled. They have, they have kept, they want to keep their distance from Jesus. Jesus is being, he's been taken by the religious leaders. He's being brought to the Roman soldiers. Uh, the, the, in this time, the Romans really ruled the land and they allowed for a certain type of government to be, uh, that, the, that the Jews could still kind of function as a people, but the ruling uh, authority in the land were the Romans. So the, the Jews arrested Jesus, but they wanted to have him put to death. The only way to have him put to death was to take him to the Romans. The Romans were the only ones who had the authority to put him to death. Now, that's interesting because there are multiple times in the story of Jesus where in the Gospels where people, the, the, the Jews get so mad that they just say, you know what, who cares about the Romans? We're going to go ahead and kill this person anyway. We're going to, you know, they'd pick up rocks to stone the woman caught in adultery, uh, all these types of things. There, there, are, there are times where they're trying to push Jesus off a cliff and they're just like, you know what, we're just going to do this right now because they're so heated. Um, but so all the, all the disciples have fled. Jesus has been arrested. Peter just denied Jesus three times according to the word of Jesus, even as he said he would. Um, so as soon as it was morning, the chief priests uh, held a consultation 
with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and they led him away to be delivered over to Pilate. Now, Pilate was the governor who was appointed by Rome. Uh, and Pilate had an, an amazing task of trying to, uh, to make the Jewish people happy, I guess. You know, I mean, as the Romans were ruling the land, the Jews did not like the Romans. The, the Jews hated the fact that they were not their own their own people, their own land. They were waiting for the Messiah to come uh, to overthrow the Romans. So the, the Jews did not, they did not like the Romans, but here they, they knew they needed Rome to do the dirty work for them. So they brought Jesus to Pilate, the governor. Pilate, I think, is an interesting uh, story. He's an interesting study. As we, look at, as we look at Pontius Pilate, the one that uh, has the authority to say yes or no to the crucifixion of Jesus, because what we're going to see is that Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. All the way through, you just see this tension that Pilate is just a politician. But I think that we can relate to Pilate because Pilate is just feeling the pressure of standing for Jesus when everybody's standing against him, and Pilate will fail. But they bound Jesus, they led him away, they delivered him to Pilate, verse 2. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them, you have, or he answered him, you have said so. Pilate comes to Jesus as they are coming and they're, they're bringing Jesus before Pilate. They are, they're saying, listen, this man in our, in our uh, system is worthy of death. He is blaspheming. Uh, he claims to be the king of the Jews. He, you know, he's claiming to be the Messiah. At this point, Jesus has made these claims. Jesus wrote, when he came into Jerusalem for the time of Passover, the holiday that they're currently celebrating, people were worshiping him and he was receiving worship. And the Jews, the religious people, the religious leaders were not having it. So they deliver him to Pilate. Now, Pilate is only concerned about one thing. If Pilate's going to get involved, there's only one thing that's going to condemn Jesus. And it's this. He says he's the king of the Jews. If Jesus claims to be the king of the Jews. Now he's a threat to Rome because in this time there was to be no king other than uh, Caesar. And so when Pilate comes to Jesus, he's just going to ask him one question, one question that could either make uh, condemn him or truly free him. If he does, if he if he defends himself and he says, you know what, I'm not the king of the Jews. I'm just a carpenter. I'm just a preacher. I'm just a rabbi. I'm anything but the king of the Jews. But he comes to him, and and the one question that that Pilate is concerned about. Are you the king of the Jews? Do you consider yourself to be the king of the Jews? Are you a threat to Rome? And Jesus says, you have said so. What does that mean? You have said so. Uh, <laughs> I, I, perhaps it is that Jesus is, is just leaving it on Pilate. You said it. You've said it. What do you do with me? This is something that we see in the other Gospels when we look at, the, when we look at Pilate. One of the things that we see with Pilate is Jesus puts it on Pilate. You have to make the choice. You've said it. What do you say about me? We see that in, in, in all, when we read the story of Pilate, we see that in John's gospel. I'm pretty sure it's John's gospel <clears throat> where Jesus is trying to get Pilate to make his own decision about Jesus. He's not, he's not going to allow him to simply uh, default to what the other people are saying because that's where Pilate's going. But Jesus is always trying to, to, pigeon, to pigeonhole, is that the right term? Uh, Pilate and get him to make a decision about him. Listen, I think he does that with all of us, doesn't he? That Jesus... It's, it's not about what the world says about Jesus. It's not about what your family says about Jesus. It, it's, it doesn't matter what, what your friends say about Jesus. What matters is what you say about Jesus. You have said so, Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Pilate. Every single one of us is, is accountable for what we say of Jesus. We are all accountable for what, where we stand when it comes to Jesus. When somebody presents Jesus to us, when we read of Jesus, it, there is not going to be any, when we stand before God and he asks us this question, what do you do with Jesus? Who was Jesus? There is not going to be any room for us to, to say, well, you know what? My mom didn't teach me. Or the churches, uh, the, you know, the pastors and the churches were corrupt. Or I was an American. We're not going to be able to lump ourselves in with any other group of people and, and that, that our um, 
belief of Jesus is not based on anybody else. It's truly based on he wants you to answer the question, is he the king of the Jews? He puts it on Pilate. You have said so. Verse 3, and the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? So how, see how many charges they bring against you. And Jesus made no further answer. So that Pilate was amazed. Jesus was not here to defend himself. Jesus right here is here to surrender. He has said multiple times already up until this point that he was going to die in Jerusalem and that he was going to rise three days later. Listen, nothing, even Pilate wasn't going to stop this from happening. Pilate wasn't going to make it so that Jesus was not going to be crucified, but Pilate had to make a decision about Jesus as to which side of this thing he was going to be on. But Jesus won't defend himself. He keeps silent. He allows the people to make the decisions about him. Verse 6. Now the feast, now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For, I, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? Let's get, let, we'll go into verse 14 in a minute. So Pilate has a custom at the feast. It's Passover time. There's at least, there, it, it seems, about two and a half million people in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. This is a massive festival. That's even right why Pilate's there at this time. Pilate would normally live in, in Caesarea Philippi. He is currently in Jerusalem because of the Passover. There's millions of people who are here. And during this feast, he had a custom to release to them a prisoner, somebody who uh, maybe they would, they would, um, they would want to see mercy shown. Uh, maybe it was a rebel who had stood against Rome. But he, during this feast, it's, he's going to release one person. And, they, and the crowd's even asking. They said, hey, release for us one person. But the chief priests say, you know what? Let's get the murderer, Barabbas, to be released instead of Jesus. I love the picture of Barabbas. Barabbas is a murderer. He's, a, he's not a good guy. And he's the one who they release instead of Jesus. This picture of Barabbas is a picture of me. He's a picture of you. This is exactly what happens, that Jesus, the innocent one, gets condemned, gets crucified. It gets taken to the cross. But the one who is guilty, the murderer, the evil, is the one who is released the, that, that God in his mercy puts the judgment on his son and the one who is guilty is set free. That Barabbas is just simply another picture along the way, a picture of the gospel, a picture of you and a picture of me. I don't know what comes of Barabbas. I don't know where he goes after this. I don't know if he ever sees the, 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 the depths of what God did for him in this moment. But the people stir up the crowd. The religious leaders stir up the crowd to say, release for us Barabbas. And so he releases Barabbas. But verse 14 again, uh, it says, And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They want to crucify Jesus. But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Verse 15, so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So here Pilate again, I mean, you got to imagine, you know, I mean, I've felt peer pressure of, you know, 10 people in a room trying to t get me to, to, to go in a certain direction. Um, here you have Pilate and you have the talk of the town. You have Jesus and the people are stirred up and there's 200 or sorry, 2.5 million plus people who are, who are in Jerusalem at the time. And he wants to kind of keep the peace. He doesn't want to riot. This would be massive. And so he is, he is afraid of the crowd. He wants to appease the crowd. Listen, <clears throat> a couple of thoughts. Number one, don't try to appease the crowd. Don't, don't try to appease the crowd. There, there is this thing of momentum. 
A crowd will create momentum. You see the riots that happen, you know, after a political decision or after, you know, um, I've seen them after police shootings and these types of things, these riots that happen. Um, emotions can get going really easy, really fast. Be careful. Be careful um, not to get caught up in the moment. Be, be the one who steps back and thinks. Be the one who looks at things objectively. Be the one who always tries to put yourself in other people's shoes. Be the one who tries to see the whole picture. Um, <clears throat> there are certain people that I've been around, and truly, I guess you could say, it's probably the majority of us. Most of us are this way. If the crowd is going in a certain direction, we tend to jump on the bandwagon. Most of us do. We feel like we don't, right? You think you don't. You're like, oh, I'm the exception to this. No, you're not. The temptation is in all of us to, to just go where the crowd goes. And so people get, you know, all, all uh, excited about something. Um, you know, you're seeing, you, you, you see only through your eyes. You see your part of the story. Um, man, be care Here, here's an example of that. Be careful when, when your friends come to you and they start telling you about the evils of somebody else. Because I tell you this. Before you get like, oh man, that's terrible, and you side with your friend, even though they, you're their friend, I tell you what, if you were the friend of the other person, you would side with the other person. Because that's just kind of human nature. We caught, get caught up in the wave, and we just kind of go with the wave, and that's exactly what Pilate's doing here. He's just trying to appease the people, and the people are just riled up, and the, and the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes, they're, they're inciting the crowd. They're they're kind of directing the wave and it's the momentum of it is just picking up speed as they are uh as they're chanting and as they're crying out and they're looking at the blasphemy of this man Jesus and they're crying out crucify him crucify him and Pilate's like why what did he even do but the crowd is just saying crucify him and they're bloodlust and they're just they're just being taken by the wave the current of the moment we need to be careful we need to be careful. That's the that'll that'll happen. We'll get we'll get stirred up. We'll see things uh, only from our own point of view. We need to be careful. And then it says Barabbas. They had him scourged. Look at this. I, I got this little note of what it means that they're scourged in my Bible. It says a Roman judicial penalty consisting of a severe beating with a multi-lashed whip containing embedded pieces of bone and metal. So this scourging was brutal. This scourging was ripping Jesus' flesh from his body. Uh, some have said that it would expose their organs, sometimes their bone. I mean, he, he, he got this beating before he ever even uh, is moved towards the cross. Jesus is being beaten. Um, again, from the other Gospels, one of the things that I've seen is that the reason why they're doing this is to try to show mercy to Jesus because he doesn't want to have Jesus crucified. He's hoping that the, that the punishment that he gets before he goes to the cross will be enough to appease the people that they will stop asking for his death because they'll say, you know what, he's suffered enough, let him go. But they're beating him, they're whipping him, they're scourging him. Hmm. We've got a little bit of time left. Let's keep going. Verse 16. And the soldiers led him away <clears throat> inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns. They put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage, that, homage to him. So they're they're mocking him as a king. And now it's, it's the soldiers who have gotten in on this. The soldiers who are, who are just going along with the crowd. The crowd's against them. Everybody's against Jesus. Verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and they put his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. Let's go a little further. I was only planning on getting that far, but let's keep going. And they compelled the passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry the cross. Now, who is this? Simon is this man, uh, African man. He's a black man. He seems to stand out. They compel him. They make him 
carry the cross for Jesus. Jesus is so beat down, so beat up, so bloodied, so broken that the weight of the cross is even too much. And so they pull this man who stands out in the crowd. He's come for the Passover. He's made a long journey. He seems to have brought his sons because it makes mention of Alexander and Rufus, his sons. He brought them to see the Passover, to, to, to celebrate the feast. He's traveled into Jerusalem. Now, here's the thing. Alexander and Rufus. Rufus is mentioned later on in the New Testament as part of the church, as part of Christianity. It seems that that, that, that Simon's sons, and perhaps it is Simon himself, became believers in Jesus. Simon, the one who carried the cross for Jesus, and his sons watching and seeing this whole thing go down later on become part of the church, become part of, Christ, become part of the Christian church. Isn't it amazing that here you have everybody standing against Jesus? You have the religious leaders, the religious people standing against Jesus. You have the Romans mocking him, pretending to worship him beating him down. You have uh, Pilate turning his back on him. You have his disciples running, fleeing, hiding, uh, denying. And then you've got Simon who's brought in. The outsider, the Gentile, brought in. And he takes part in this. And his, and his children become followers of Jesus. His children become used of God that that listen that isn't that an amazing picture this is this is only I'm only seeing this right now so I hope I'm not ruining the picture but but here you have the Jews scattered the Jews God's people the disciples the religious leaders God's people rejecting Jesus and as a result of the rejection of Jesus Simon is brought close the Gentile brought close the Gentile carrying the cross for Jesus. The, who's there when Jesus goes to his death? Who's there? Not the, not the people who are supposed to be there. Not the people who are his people. Peter denied him, but, but no, Simon was close enough that he actually carried the cross. His sons became followers in the rejection. When it, the, the New Testament teaches us that. When, the, when, the, when God's people, Israel, rejects Jesus, Jesus finds another people. He gets another people, the Gentiles. He brings us in, me who is not, not, a person, not one of his people by birth, but by choice. He brought me close. And he compels them to carry the cross, but they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So they offer him this, this uh, basically medicine, this, this to numb the pain. But Jesus is taking on the full pain. Jesus is taking on all of the suffering. Hey, Devin's on here. How you doing, man? Uh, Jesus will not will not take the, the numbing of the pain, but he wants to take the full piece. Verse 24, and they crucified him and they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them. Now, this idea that they cast lots for his garments, they strip Jesus, he's naked uh, when they put him on the cross. They take his garments and they cast lots for his garments because his garment was a special kind of garment that, that didn't have a seam in it. It was sewn in one piece and they cast lots for him. And this idea of casting lots goes back to the Old Testament that it was going to be uh, that they were going to cast lots for Jesus' clothing. This idea of kind of, you know, drawing straws to see who gets it was prophesied in the Old Testament, and it was already pre-spoken of. The, these people are, it, this goes to show that, that they are just simply following their, their, their pre-written role in God's plan. Man, we could go into that, but we're not going to. Um, eventually we will, you'll see. So they cast lots for his clothing, clothing to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. I think of this. Whenever you read in the paper, I don't think anybody reads in the paper anymore, so whenever you read on Facebook, wherever you read it, whenever you read of a criminal being, being condemned or being sentenced to death or being sentenced to some kind of a, uh, a certain amount of time in prison, whenever I read of those things, I never consider the fact that that person might be innocent. You know, they've gone through a trial, they've gone through a process, and I'm always, I always just, you, you know, you just assume if they're being uh, sentenced to 
some kind of a punishment, it's because they committed some kind of a crime. And so if you were to see Jesus hanging on a cross and next to him you see two thieves, he's lumped in with criminals, most people would just say he's got to be guilty. He's got to be guilty. There's no way he's innocent. And so Jesus taking on the guilt of you and me, he takes on the sin and he's hang, hanging on a cross between two two robbers, two criminals, verse 29. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Everybody at this point has turned against him, except for maybe Simon and his sons. All of Israel has turned against him. Even the robbers being crucified next to him are saying, save yourself. Save yourself, Jesus. Deliver yourself. Pilate at the beginning said, deliver you. You know, why won't you, why won't you defend yourself? Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Can you not hear what they're saying about you? Why won't you defend yourself, Jesus? The robbers, why won't you get yourself down, Jesus? Can you not? Can you not, can you not get off the cross? Can you not save yourself? Hmm. Jesus allowed all of this to happen. He allowed all of this to happen. We, we have this, man, maybe, maybe I can link this a little bit to Haiti to end it up here. One of the things that we're challenged by, especially when you see Christians, you go to a place like Haiti and you see Christians there, one of the, one of the challenges is we get this weird idea uh, that if God's in it, it's going to be easy. If God's in it, it's going to be, um, man, it's going to be abundant. You know, if, if God's walking with us, if, if, if we're in God's will, we're not going to suffer. We're not going to feel any pain. You know, and we think we don't have that kind of a prosperity thing going on within us, but it's there when, when you go and you start seeing the poverty and you start seeing the desperation in a place like Haiti and you begin to ask like, God, where are you in this? Where are you? How is it that the people who are trying to follow you barely have enough food to eat? How is it that, 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 you know, you've got orphans that, you know, little tiny babies who are in, in an orphanage, they have no parents, no, you know, and, and they just sit in a room in a crib and, and, and maybe the people who work at the orphanage kind of rotate babies out to kind of hold them. But, but here you have this orphanage. Most of these kids will never be adopted. Even if, even if everybody in America wanted to adopt these kids, it's just that the system's broken and so they can't be adopted. Lord, where are you in this? And we get this idea that somehow if, if God is on our side, if God is for us, then none of these things are going to happen, then none of this suffering is going to happen, that truly if Jesus has the power to do it, then he will do it. If he can deliver himself from the cross, then he would deliver himself from the cross. If he could deliver me from trial, then he will deliver me from trial. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that he's going to always deliver us. As a matter of fact, the disciples seem to embrace trial. They were called to embrace trial, the hardships of life. They were called to, to, re, to rejoice in times of trial. That when things got tough, that thank you, Lord, that I get to experience you in, in this way. And James says, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? That, that in our abundance, sometimes it, it, it robs our faith because we think that God is in the, in the prosperity. That God is in the you know, everything's good, that there's no pain, that that's where, that's where we see God, that, that, that all of the polish and, 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 man, yeah, Estelle says, Paul and Silas worshiped in prison. Jesus himself suffered at the will of God. He went through this because it was the will of God. He went through it for the, for others, he went through it for me and for you. He went through suffering and pain. He allowed himself to continue to hang on the cross for the glory of God. 
just a completely, you know, it, it's it's wild because that was that was just this underlying, uh, you know, thing that I think we as as the Americans had when we we're in Haiti is we just see the suffering around us and we're just like, where's God in this? And and we we think, man, we see we see the suffering of the people and we think, where's God? He's not here. You know, even some of us. Uh, there, there were comments that were made of just like, you know, I, th I think uh, if, if I was living in this, I'd, I'd probably be angry at God. And I got to tell you, listen, suffering is part of the journey because listen, it's not about here and now. It's about his kingdom. It's about his, his purposes. It's about his glory. It's about him. And so we come to him. We follow him. We want his will to be done. Yes, it's hard. Yes, there's suffering involved, but it's all about his glory and his purpose. That's as far as we're going to get today, guys. Um, I did feel a little scattered, maybe out of practice. I don't know. I apologize for that. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to pick up in verse 33. We're going to finish out chapter, uh, chapter 15, um, and then we'll do the resurrection, talk about the resurrection on Monday uh, after you go to church on Easter. If you do, I hope you will. Um, so that's as far as we're going to get. We're going to see the death and burial of Jesus tomorrow. Uh, thank you guys for, for getting up, doing this again with me. Always excited to see your names popping up. Um, man. Awesome. That's all I got. Uh, God bless you guys. Hey, you know what? I'm going to pray. John likes it when we pray at the end, so I'm going to pray. Hmm. Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to teach us, continue to show us what your will is, what your desire is, Lord, that you would open our minds, unpack these thoughts in our minds. Lord, I pray that you would take us deeper into your word, take us deeper into an understanding of it, that we could live it out. Um, Lord, we, we pray for this weekend uh, as churches all over the country celebrating Easter uh, in, in remembrance of the things that we're reading even today. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would give us right heart, right perspective, that you would just draw people to yourself through your son. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, see you tomorrow. Get up, 6 a.m., set an alarm. I'll be here. All right, later. Hold on, I'm reading your comment, Pat. That's good. Hmm. Sorry to hear that, Pat, but that conversation, man, God's going to give you wisdom on it. Oh, so good. Um, uh, Darren, you asked if, if Pilate's wife had any, any part in this um, to play. She did. She had a dream. Um, we saw that in Matthew. Uh, she had a dream saying, stay away from this guy, Jesus. So it's not just in the movies. It's, it was truly part of the story. Just not in Mark. Mark doesn't pick up on that. Um, yeah, the uh, Passion of the Christ pictures it. Man. Um, nothing apart from God more. Yeah. I'd love to go to India, Darren. Um, awesome. Awesome. Okay, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, guys.